Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to episode 95. I'm going to say 95. Five or six. Anyway, 95 or six of the Mindhouse podcast. I've got to the left of me, uh, Muhammad, and to the right of me, a big freezer. Oh. Okay. <laughs> In a different room. Today. Pretty cool. Pretty cool either side of you. See, that was a dad joke. <laughs> <laughs> that was a dad joke. <laughs> oh, it was a dad joke. Swear. Lovely. I'd help it. Lovely. I'd um, help it. Yeah, bro. So this episode, we'll just go into Q and A, inshallah. Um, so, so you get the usual thing. What's it called? The the curious cat. Curious cat. I always forget if we got Ask FM or Curious Cat. But yeah, They're basically cool. the same, aren't they? So there are a few, bro, from uh, July, um, which were I think more comments uh, than questions. So I just want to write, uh, read the, them out. I suppose I'll start by reading one out. Then we'll go to the curious cat, right? So oh. this one was about uh, uh, episode eighty-two, which was uh, the Black Lives Matter one. And okay. This sister says, "Salam alaikum." Jazakallah khairan for the last podcast. I found it very insightful, expressing different angles, which are quite in opposition with popular mainstream ideas. I really appreciate the honest discussion, as most people don't express or even touch upon a lot of the points for fear of backlash. From what I see, a lot of people don't like to hear some of the realities and victim mentalities that you two discussed. I do believe that people could benefit a lot from this podcast episode in general. So with that said, I wanted to advise, maybe you should put that podcast back up and take it off unlisted. <laughs> uh. Yes, we did that. Um, then we replied to her. What did we say? We said, uh, oh, yeah, we're, we're doing another episode, a follow-up episode. So is there anything you'd like us to mention? Yep. And then she said, uh, just some comments. So she said, um, well, there are a few points that people made comments about on your video and just in general, like the ones about why didn't you bring a black person when talking about these issues? The podcast is just your two perspectives. Um, that seems to be the point. So why bring someone else for this podcast in particular? It's almost like when they say you have to bring a woman to speak about feminism and as if black people were the only ones who experienced racism. Maybe they may, maybe they may have experienced more as a whole, but really others know what it feels like too. Plus, I mean, already made the point that we could, we could kind of get the gist of their feelings by hearing their experiences, etc. And then another point she made is, I don't really understand how people protest and go crazy saying stop racism. What is racism? To a lot of these people, racism may be the stereotypes people have in their minds. And because they have these stereotypes, people may treat them bad or in an unfair way. For the Muslims, all they have to do is hear ayat or hadith, and that's it for those who have iman. And as for those Muslims who are not affected by the Quran and Sunnah, then may Allah guide them. That's all we could say. Uh, if they don't even take heed to what Allah's messenger said, what worth is their opinion? <laughs> and likewise with Kuffar, if their opinion bothers us, then that's our fault because we gave them that status that they don't deserve. The best way for African-Americans to change people's points of view of them is just to get out there and break them. I know an African-American sister with her whole army of children, they started to go to masjid that is mostly Pakistani, they were kind of uncomfortable with her at first, but her and her family are very nice people, mashallah, and after some time, they all got along really well. In fact, that same sister had another American, African-American friend, and she mentioned that masjid. Her friend responded saying that the people in the masjid are racist. My friend told her, no, they are not racist. You just don't understand them. These stereotypes are present, and to an extent, they may be true. All cultures may have their low points and high points. For example, I know a lot of Daisy families could be a bit crazy in their dealings with one another. I know not all of them are like that, but when I meet someone who's Daisy, I keep this idea in mind and just treat everyone individually. They may be crazy, they may not be. And those are kind of the, the main ideas that she wanted to share with us. So, yeah. Anything to comment on that? <laughs> Quite a lot I said there. Uh, I suppose yeah. one of the points you know here was... in the email it just looks like two uh, paragraphs, but it's long paragraphs, I guess. <laughs> yeah. No, I think um, yeah, one of the key points there is just about exposure, isn't it? About exposing yourselves to 
putting yourself in arenas where others will be exposed to your culture and your religion and um and communities as well like you know they said about that um sister going to a predominantly pakistani masjid uh, it's about force force mixing or whatever um it's not always easy though is it you know it may have worked out for her but for a lot of people it doesn't work out um yeah and, and and it's a big responsibility, and not not everybody can, not everybody has the time, patience, or energy to to fight that fight. It's a lot easier for people to just assimilate within their own, you know, yeah, in their own cultures true. and their own people. Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, definitely what she said. Uh, the first point she was making in terms of uh, we, you know, we don't have to be uh, black to talk about racism. We don't have to be women to talk about uh, feminism or whatever. Um, of course that is true but you know what I feel bro is that uh, everybody needs to take it upon themselves to become a uh, filterer of the information they receive right mm. so for example I may comment on uh, freezers okay you got a freezer here next to me I may yeah. talk in this podcast about freezers and you know freezers that are like this are the best ones and this brand is the best one but it's up to the audience to decide, is this guy, am I going to take his opinion seriously or not? Like, what's his background when it comes to freezers? You know, does he know how many freezers he owned in his life? Blah, blah, right? Yeah. So I feel like just generally, yeah, and it, it, honest, I understand that it's, it's sometimes annoying to hear somebody saying something that's just wrong. And you feel like, yes, it's just completely wrong what he's saying. But I feel like uh, generally, Yanni, people are leaning more towards don't let people talk in general, like get so mad when they say things that are wrong rather than like, that's fine, but you need to also put responsibility on the listener to be able to filter for themselves and, yeah. you know, get that. So like when we're talking um, about, let's say America, then they know that we're not American, right? Yeah. And, and they can judge for themselves how much credibility our opinion on that holds. And that's why, you know, sometimes... I'm, I'm actually surprised how comfortable I am talking about something I'm not an expert on on this podcast, but that's because I actually, I, I've become a bit more comfortable because I want people to approach this podcast as I'm just a mean, like who, who am I? Right. Yeah. But there are certain areas I would consider myself to be, you know, kind of knowledgeable on, but most things I'm not that knowledgeable on, but if you, let's say you're American and you're listening to me, Maybe you say, oh, he doesn't get that because of this. But there might be one idea that is like new to you because you're in America and I'm not. And yeah. that's like beneficial, you know? So mm. I think we just need to have a bit, take responsibility as a listener. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that cancel culture, bro. Everyone's affected by it. As soon as someone says something that's, you know, out of line yeah, yeah. or yeah. they just get canceled straight away. And that's what it kind of was. Yeah, exactly. I um, suppose it's like cancel culture is... Is, is that same thing where the responsibility is fully on the speaker and there's no responsibility on the listener. You know, yeah. the listener can do some work themselves to filter things, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. definitely. Okay, what's next? Oh, let's have a look. Da, 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 da. Uh, this is from the 15th of October says lol my question is starts with a lol <laughs> so good good sign <laughs> uh, <laughs> see we're lolling now so I'm, I'm, I'm reading it out word for word <laughs> my, my question is how are y'all so calm especially in a world where the most extroverted slash hyper individual garners the most attention any books that have affected y'all's demeanor i keep saying y'all as well <laughs> 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 any uh, individual guy is the most, you know, any books that have affected the old demeanor or what's your thought processes when interacting with others? If you could speak on manners and how upbringing influenced y'all's current personality. That's three y'alls, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Uh, let's think. It may be that you're just getting a slice of life in terms of you're getting a little bit of what we're like on the podcast and not what we're like outside of it and it's very important because everyone you see is giving you a presentation not their truest self um for example i feel like 
I'm not very calm. I try to be, but I'm, I always slip into being an absolute goof all the time. Um, and I always resent myself for doing so. And I have to like rein myself back in. But I don't know if that's something everybody has, but I know I definitely do. I definitely was worse when I was younger. Um, always made a fool of myself and, you know, a bit of a class clown and stuff because it's like the only way I felt like I could be accepted. Oh my God, this is getting really deep. <laughs> but no. Um, keep, keep going, bro. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't until... No, a lot of, you know, a lot of things happen when you get older and, you know, life gets a bit tough. You you just have no choice but to sort of chill out. But there's, it's, it's two, there's two sides to that. You could either go even more as like a defense mechanism. You go a bit more goofy and a bit more, you know, excitable and stuff. Um, and I'm using, you know, being goofy and laughing too much and excitable as an antithesis to this, even though they've said calm. So the opposite of calm could also be like angry or frustrated all the time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that could be, that could be it. And that can happen. Depends what you're going through. Um, I think it ties in a lot with E-Man. I think the higher, the more, the, the more, you know, the more E-Man you have in your heart, the more conscious you are of Allah, the more stoic you sort of become, the more, you know, yeah, the more self-restraint and control you have of your personality. And I think naturally, when you think of, you you, you know, you, you have this code in your mind after you've been practicing for however many years, you have this sort of code of like the Prophet So you so, so. you naturally, you naturally try to align to, to him and his demeanor whenever you, you know, get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's like sort of what you're inclined to do. Um but that only, you know, I, I get like that when I'm going through hardship. Like, what if I'm going through some sort of hardship, bro? Like, alhamdulillah, the best thing out of that hardship is my my uh, mentality and my track record and that. Because um, I could be, I, all I'm thinking about is the hardship, thinking about Allah's plan, thinking about how to get relief out of it. But when things are going easy, that is the easiest time to start losing your way and start getting a bit goofy and forgetful and, you know. I don't know about you. How did you feel? You you seem to be quite. But then again, once again, I already see what you, what you showed me. So, you know, bro, I actually am very calm. Um, My show. What I mean by that is, uh, I struggle to get angry. For example. Okay. Uh, so it's just fadlimin Allah, yani. I, I didn't do anything to get this way. I can't uh, mm. say I had any hand in it. Um, so yeah, I I actually am calm. You know, with you, bro, like I see you as calm, but then again, like I haven't seen you much outside of the podcast. So knowing that you're North African, I'll be like, yeah, it's probably, this guy's probably not calm. <laughs> uh, I think, I think if you were like, yeah, you're, you're right. We haven't, we've, we've spent very, very little time outside of. Probably a total of, a total hours. of eight hours together. Eight hours, maybe. Yeah, actually, because they came down here years ago. Um yeah, but I think, you know, what? a lot of it will probably come down to your parents. I wanted to speak about this anyway uh, at the end of last episode, but it might be a good segue. Uh, seeing how much influence your behavior has on your children and then that sort of carries on. Mm -hmm. So, like, I'm becoming a lot more um, conscious of Suleiman. So, Suleiman, my oldest son is, how old is he? About three and a half-ish, maybe a bit older. Um, and... Obviously, he has his personality now, quite quite defined, at least for his age. Um, but then I'm like, I'm very, cri not critical. Yeah, maybe not critical. Maybe like I analyze a lot of his behavior and like how much of that is me? How much of that is his mom? Where's he getting this from? And especially considering he spent very little time like at nursery and stuff like this. So he was in, he was in nursery for like a few months and then COVID came around and we took him out and he hasn't been back in there since. He doesn't, unfortunately, because of... Uh, however how many you know muslims are on in in this city there's not that many so he doesn't socialize that much with kids his age you know it's not it's not quite often you know it's we do take him when we can but it's not very often especially now with lockdowns and all this stuff so all of his behavior is going to really predominantly be from us so it's kind of a good experiment um but little things like i try to understand um, you know, where he gets his sort of personalities from. So 
literally copied and pasted, bro. Some of the things, 90% of the stuff he says or reacts to things, I like copied and pasted from us. And, and like, if he gets angry, then I can tell he's just imitating me. If he gets, now he, now, like at this age, he starts saying, oh, I want to copy Baba. I'm copying Baba. So if I put a thobe on him, like I put a thobe on him earlier, bro. He's like, oh, I copy Baba. He puts a face mask on, he's like, I copy Baba. He sat down earlier before we started. He grabbed this laptop, sat down. He goes, I do a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then he's like no i want to do a podcast okay um but you know when he when he loses his temper he says he does things that we say to him so like uh, i'm not happy with you you know i'll say that to him because i won't be happy with him if he does something wrong and he'll say that back to us he'll say uh mm. um yeah i don't know like uh, you know i'm not talking to you anymore something like that like you know we try he, he Whenever he gets angry, he will throw back on us the things we say to him, as if he's like trying to parent us as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but but in the same in the same vein as that, there's things he'll do, like I might do if I'm upset or angry or frustrated about something. You know, maybe I you know I might just walk out of the room or say, "Oh, for goodness' sake," or something like that. And he'll say the same thing. He mm-hmm. he, he emulates that completely. Um, he got up, he, he was a bit, you know, misbehaved a little bit earlier and we sort of told him off. And I was trying to examine him being upset because usually he's quite uh, happy and cheerful and, you know, he's always like, want to have a laugh and stuff. But he was upset. So I was sort of critically analysing what he does when he's upset. So he, he came over to the sofa and he like curled up and just like faced the wall. And then I thought, Spala, where does that come from? Like I was, I know, I know, I know I was deeply analysing that, but I was trying to think, where does that come from? Like, does he, is that like a natural human thing to get up in the, in the fetal position and sort of like shine yourself away and stuff? Because that, to me, him separating himself like that is quite a mature way of doing it. Because yeah. usually I'd, I'd consider kids would be like clingy and running over to, and then what he did, which is important, which ties into what I'm trying to basically ultimately say in the response to this question, is um, he started doing things that like, once again, upset uh, like that I do when I'm, you know, having a bit of a, for example, if I have a disagreement with my wife and, you know, she might be upset with me, I will, I can't hold no grudges or anything for like more than 10 minutes. And I would like start making like jokes or something like trying to sort of break the ice sort of thing. And he started doing that. So he was upset. I was sitting on the computer and then he just started like sneaking over to me and trying to like tickle my toes. Like, <laughs> even though I'm angry with him and stuff, he's doing basically the same thing. So it's this sort of thing, bro. And then this is why I was trying to allude to maybe the reason you are, you know, you've got this way about you is because maybe that's how your parents may have reacted or responded to hardship or, or even towards you, you know, it's, it's, it's very much based like that. I mean, Mm. you know I, I know that maybe some of my temper i can see where that comes from you know within my family and i can see how i react and, and i can see similarities between myself and my father and that sort of stuff you know you know i think you're right in terms of i can see that in my son like i can yeah. see at least you know when it's your first child you know you're not sure how you're not sure how all babies are and how yours is in it so yeah, yeah. But I feel like uh, he's quite calm, maybe compared mm. to others. Yeah. And that could be from from us. Um, yeah. As for me, I'm not a good example of that because I wouldn't say my parents are that calm. Okay. Uh, but maybe that's also why I am calm because either I just wanted to counter it or I'm just stubborn. So it's like, you're going to be so excitable. Well, then I'll be so, what's the opposite of that? Just yeah. like unreactive yeah Yeah. uh it could be that but but one thing if there's anything i think of that kind of helps me in terms of this is specifically in terms of uh uh, uh, being angry or or getting uh you know when you do things out of ego yeah one thing that helped me i don't know when i started thinking like this was i started asking myself the question if i'm gonna lash out like what react let's say i'm going to react a certain way because of somebody's triggered my you know ego made me look bad right whatever it is am i doing it for me is that for my benefit or is it for my ego's benefit and i kind of separate the two so if it's just for my ego's benefit i'm like well that's going to benefit my ego but not me necessarily so i've got to i'm going to serve me i'm not going to serve my ego 
And that kind of helped me actually make decisions. Like, you know, sometimes, you know, when you're younger, especially people provoke you, they want to fight with you, for example, and they're provoking you, you know, they might be pushing you a bit because they want to fight with you. I was thinking like, look, okay, my ego wants to fight, but it won't benefit me. It'll just benefit my ego to know that, oh yeah, he pushed me and I didn't let it go. Yeah, but yeah, ultimately, yeah. it's not for my benefit to actually fight with this guy. So I'm going to leave it. And who cares what my ego thinks? You know what I mean? So that's yeah. kind of uh, something that I thought exercise, Annie. I think it's quite high maintenance for me, though. Like, um, for example, I'm very easily influenced by whatever I consume in terms of books or lectures or whatever have you. So um if I can, can, if I continue that stream of positive influence, then I can keep that up. The moment I let my guard down, then it's like a downward spiral, and it takes a while for me to get back on top, like in control of myself again. Mm. For example, like, and especially if things are very impactful. So, like, speaking of ego, like reading, for example, ego is the enemy, or stuff like that, or listening to lectures about the neps and self control and stuff like that. Um, that can keep me going for a while. It's like f- fueling up a car, bro. Um, and then when your tank's empty, if I get distracted or lose, you know, lose that sort of enthusiasm, then um, it becomes sort of self-destructive. Well, not so. I wouldn't say as bad as self-destructive, but it beca- you become neg- negligent of your own sort of um, self-betterment. Basically, I think it's 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 quite similar to like if you if you're not always improving or actively trying to improve, you can't really stay the same level. Um, yes. I don't know what a good analogy would be. Basically, that. that's what, probably an analogy. If you're not grow, if you're not growing, you're dying, isn't it? Yeah, Basically. yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's almost like rolling a ball up the hill, bro. Like it won't stay still. You have to yes. keep pushing it up. The moment you let go, it's going to start yeah, rolling yeah. back down. There's no rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because and, mm. there's so much out there in terms of distraction, in terms of you know that which like actually up to a week, like a last week, bro. Like not even that last week a few days ago maybe before we recorded bro um it it felt like it'd been so long since i'd done anything meaningful or spiritual or um you know had that closeness that you could literally i could literally feel like my heart was like almost like rigid bro like you know they 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 speak about how um, a lost part of the puts puts almost like a rust on somebody's heart Mm -hmm. and it started feeling like that like my heart was like rigid bro like i hadn't felt anything strong or powerful in a while and on the same on the same wavelength as that the blessing is identifying that like i i'm not a person who likes to allow shaitan to sort of put me in a um in a sort of oh you're you've already missed out so much so you might as well give up or you've done something bad so you might as well not do any good do you know what i mean like who are you to do good after you've done bad or who are you Mm -hmm. to come back to allah after this or who are you to only ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you're in need you know that's that's one thing yeah i feel guilty for only asking allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when i'm in need but at the same time I don't want that thought to stop me because then Shaitan's winning twice. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, he may have beat me the first time round, but I don't want him to beat me again when when I identify that he's beaten me and be yeah. like, oh, he's beat me once. Let me, do you get me? So, yeah, it's just about carrying on and, and getting back up. And mm. because I think, I don't know about you, but it's easy to fall, in, to fall into a trap of being like, oh, look at all these people that are so consistent, or so constant, or always elevating, or always... You know, and that's why I try and humanize people as much as possible. That's why I don't like we spoke about it last episode about sinning and and these, you know, whether whether it's an alim or whether it's you know an MMA fighter, bro. If they're sinning, bro, I, I try and remind myself that all of these people sin, no matter what level they're on. And you know, just like Sheikh so and so that you idolize, for example, or look up to, he has sins that he's embarrassed about. And I I sometimes think like I I imagine them sinning just so I can humanize them mm-hmm. just so I can say that if he can sin and carry on and excel so can I mm-hmm. you know and that's the best way to do it inshallah. that's good yeah and and the you know when it comes to being calm I mean being calm is one thing but being feeling frustrated or angry or excitable and then still being calm mm. uh, that is that's a different category I feel you know that's that's the hallmark of a real man. I think the, you know, the number one trait of a real man is self-control and self-control can only happen when there is an urge within you that is out, that wants to be out of control. Right. So it's like, there's no benefit in like, there's nothing praiseworthy about a guy who 
uh, isn't aggressive. He, he just doesn't feel any aggression. And then he doesn't fight because of it. He doesn't pick on people because of it. He doesn't bully people because he doesn't feel any aggression. That mm. guy's not really praiseworthy. He's not holding anything back. He's just being him with no effort per se, right? Yeah. Whereas the guy who feels the aggression and holds back, that is the praiseworthy thing, yeah. right? So, you know, like, so yeah, basically self-control is is really the hallmark of of a real mm. man. Like the professor, let me said, in a, in a context of men, fighting wrestling with each other trying to show their you know superiority over the others you know and he said uh, you know laser laser basura that the strong one the powerful one is not the is not shown with wrestling with strength yeah in the the one who's the strong one is the one who controls his anger yeah. uh, when he when he feels anger when he gets angry so a real man he gets angry, but it, it's, it, he doesn't go out of control, basically. Yeah. That's what I, want yeah. to say. I think what benefits both Muslims and non-Muslims alike who are disciplined in that arena is the one truth that sort of unites us all, which is death itself. You know, it's the one thing that whether whatever sort of self-help book you read by Muslim, non-Muslim, whatever advice you ever get given in terms of discipline and self-control and, 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 and you know, knowing, your, knowing the value of your life is the discussion of death um especially if you like if you read like anything anything that we speak about in terms of those self-help books and stuff it's very much the discussion of death that no one either likes to have because obviously it's, it's something that scares people however um the moment you think about it like the moment you start thinking about death or you get reminded of death on a legitimate you know in a legitimate way your demeanor will change. Everything changes because then you realize, oh, actually, I shouldn't be doing this, or actually, I haven't got that much time, or especially the 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 uncertainty of it all. Um, you don't know when it will happen. You don't know what situation you're going to be in, and that just always just realigns you. It's a, it's like it's uh, it's like a compass almost. I think for everyone, for for Muslim and non-Muslim alike, an atheist who thinks about death will start trying to be disciplined and control their life and, and make the most of it in a, in a way. Um, normally speaking there are some people that use it as like oh you know live your life to the fullest go completely reckless sort of thing but mm -hmm. at the same time people who want to be product productive and make the most out of their lives and squeeze this lemon so to speak um yeah death is definitely a, a sharp reminder and i think yeah for the person ask, asking that question um yeah i think the fact that they they're asking the question means that it's something they aspire to do to be a bit more calmer and a bit more maybe stoic or a bit more, you know, self-disciplined. And I think trying to remind yourself of death, trying to put yourself in those sort of circumstances mm. and, and putting yourself through some sort of hardship. Like if you feel like you're not going through enough hardship, then expose yourself to others that are like do charity work or, or, or even, even something as basic as just literally watch stuff, like watch people going through things, watch the situations that people are in. Um, like sometimes you watch a short documentary on someone in you know Syria or someone in Palestine or and I know it's very it's become very generic to start naming these countries but the reality is there we talk about them but we don't actually expose ourselves to it that much it's sort of like something we know and we don't you know maybe once or twice in Ramadan we we, we get expose ourselves but that's because mm. Ramadan is the, the time of charity you know that's true that's a good point um Okay, back to the emails. Okay, we got these long emails that we actually addressed this email, I think, in that episode. Um, I think it was 82. So let's move on from that one. Okay, then we've got this sister emailed us in September. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I pray you are both in the best of health and iman. A worry that my friends and I are currently thinking about is uni tuition fees. Our families are working class and just don't have the funds to pay 9k a year. As practicing Muslims, we understand that taking loans, you must, that from taking loans, you must partake in the riba, which is haram. Also, my parents won't allow me to work because I'm a girl, which I understand. Whenever I do bring up the issue of money, they tell me not to worry, but I know our financial situation and can't help but worry. What me and my friends are confused about is how other people pay for their tuition fee. Not many people talk about the financial process and it just baffles me 
how all these Muslims with the same sort of financial background as me are able to go to uni. If you mm -hmm. could perhaps explain how we would go about this, my friends and I would really appreciate it. Jazakumullah khairan, I hope I didn't waffle too much. Mm. I mean, that was, a, that was a very efficient email, bro. I think yeah, that, was, that quite... wasn't waffling. No, that no, was not more like pancake, bro. <laughs> so uh, Definitely, bro. what do you think? Because I feel like uh, I'm not the normal situation. So. I think the first thing, I think I'm in a, I wouldn't say prison privileged, but I wasn't aware of the discussion about student loans or, you know, whatever. When, when you I... went to uni, was it 3K or 9 well, it was 3K when I got in. And then when I decided to do an extra year of college to get into a better uni, it became wow. nine. <laughs> um, so I lost out. But at that time, I wasn't, I only started practicing after I sort of made my university applications and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and even then, I didn't realize anything about the halal haram of it until like maybe halfway through uni, like my first year. Um, so that was that. Um, but also in in relation <coughs> to answer the question in sense of other people, because I think that was one of their concerns. Um, this the the discussion of student loans is a discussion which, in my my little knowledge, is one where there is varying opinions on it, especially in the West. Maybe not so much in the Muslim world from Muslim uh, scholars, um, not Muslim scholars. Uh, you know, not. The, other side of the West. On I don't West, like using then. the East and West. I don't mm. like using East and West anymore because it's not really like that. But what I mean is from like the Arab Muslim world. Um, but yeah, there are somewhat legitimate, or, well, legitimate really, um, arguments that student loan is a different sort of thing and maybe a necessity, etc. I can't comment on that because I'm not that sort of person. But that's an opinion that a lot of Muslims will follow. And um you know, it's it's but sort you, of like. Do you think a lot of people actually followed that though? Like people, you know, in the last I think know, the... five years, people going to uni, Muslims going to uni. How many of them went thinking, "I'm gonna take a loan, and it's not haram"? Like, surely that's small. I think. Right? Well, there's the difference between. You'll have to know what's in someone's heart and mind, bro, because there's people that took it without caring, like yeah. they didn't really. There's people that took it without knowing. There's people that took it without caring, and there's mm. people that took it with, um, with the with the valid opinion that it's permissible. Yeah. Because I just of, feel like that's situation. probably a very small uh, number of people. It'd be interesting to do a census, bro. Look, yeah. stuff, stuff like that. And I, think... I just say that because I think, like the like it was Sheikh Haydar and Haddad that came out with that fatwa, right? And the other people who have kind of shared that they agree with that are mostly people who are his students or whatever, right? So, and I, I don't know how big their reach is in terms of I follow Sheikh Haytham's fatwa. Yeah, there like, was someone um, else. Amongst like very practicing people. Yes, okay, yeah. they know him. But I just thought generally it doesn't have that big reach. I'm, I'm not sure. There was someone else, and I don't remember who hmm. that, I, in my, I can't remember who it was, but in my perspective, they were like, you know, close, close in terms of status. But they also said, about it being permissible because Wasn't Sheikh of... Sajid Omar? Oh, I don't remember. I don't remember. It was recent and it kind <laughs> we of... We shouldn't put the wrong name on a fetter. I, uh, do I didn't want to put... <laughs> I don't want to say who I think it might be just yeah, yeah. so... But... Um, and it kind of changed my perspective a little bit. Mm. Um, I mean, ultimately, arguments can be made. You know, arguments... Like, for example, you can't become a doctor without going to university. You know, and I'm talking about, I'm, and I know I'm not saying doctor because it's the most paying, but I'm talking about doctor because it's a very, it's almost like a, a fundamental part, a pillar of society. Mm, so doctors, you know, yeah. in necessities in that, in that sense. Um, you can't, for example, they speak about, there's a, there's a bit of a cash 22. So you want Muslim women to be able to uh, have like female midwives or, you know, you know, female doctors or whatever, but at the same time, we won't educate them to get to that stage. Um, so you can't have your cake and eat it. You can't say, you know, I want, I want, you go into a hospital and you're like, I want a female to deal with my wife, but then there's, you haven't actually set the groundwork and allowed women to reach those stages. Um, yeah. But obviously but we're talking once about again, the financial side. Yeah. 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 But, the, but that's another thing, the financial thing as well. Like if we're not, if we can't find an alternative, 
um, yes. then how do how do we expect the, to to fund that sort of stuff? But at the same time, there are alternatives. There are they might not be that popular, that well known. Uh, they might not have achieved that much. Um, one alternative is like, what's the rush? You know, why can't you save and then go? Universities for more or less any age, really. You can go back to uni whenever. Um, and it's it's, it's it's interesting to see how all of these uh, expectations of like, okay, you get married at this age, have kids around this age. Oh yeah, and you should go study in the university before or that and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, we just, we accept that. We accept that that timeline. Like that's the guaranteed, you know, that's what has to be done. Mm-hmm. When actually maybe it doesn't. Maybe you can get married younger, you know, and maybe then you can work together because you're both young and you're both able to work, work and save up. And then you can go to uni together and then you can go because you've saved up that money. Do you understand? And then you can have kids after you graduate if you're doing like a three year course, or whatever, or have kids whilst you're there. Bro, how many, how many, you know, I was always quite um, impressed by like uh, a lot of like students from the Khalij or, or Arab countries that would come down to, to Brighton and study here. And they'd come with their kids, bro. They'd come with their, do you know what I mean? Their partners and stuff. And Is that, that was on like, a bachelor's one or a more like PhD? I feel like it was both, bro. I feel like mm. I was seeing people from both, but a bachelor's, master's, PhD. And it was really impressive. I remember in my bachelor's degree, there was like people that were like 50 years old, bro, sitting at the front row mm. studying as well. Um, like, I don't know about I, I doing think, degree with kids. I don't. I mean, I'm not maybe, saying like it's a, a man can get away with that, but for a mother, yeah. But this, what I'm saying is like, there's there's ways and means. If you don't want to have kids because you want to do a three year course, then three years is nothing. Yeah, you know, yeah, three years is nothing. Um, if it's something else, then you have to just arrange your your life in a certain particular way. Um, so, you know, similarly to people that are uh, studying the dean. Um, a lot of brothers that go to study in Medina, they come work for six months and go and spend six months over there or have a match over there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think what we do is we attach ourselves to these normal these timelines of what's expected, and a lot of that comes with pressure from like parents and families and stuff. Yeah. There is a pressure there of like conforming to that, but um, yeah ultimately like now is ridiculous nine grand a year is ridiculous when it was three grand before bro it's not even a question yeah. you don't need a loan bro you Quite don't need manageable. a loan you just mm. yeah just work honestly you could probably even work and do it at the same time um if you're you know supported by your parents and stuff um yeah that's interesting actually like oh yeah but 9k <laughs> nine no no nine is difficult nine's difficult yeah um and but, i i'm always I, mean, I was thinking bro yeah a three-year degree, uh, if you're good at studying, like you know yeah. how to study, you know, you've got techniques for revision, you've got techniques for writing essays, you're quite good at it, uh, or you can become good at it in the first, say, six months of your degree, then really, I feel like a degree, a three-year degree can be done in one and a half years, okay? Yeah. What that means is that you should be able to work part-time and study and if you work part time, and let's say you don't need to pay rent or anything, then could you not save up nine k in a year? You, you what you could that. do is you could you could always have that sort of so you leave a year out you so to give yourself year, a head start, go, give yourself a head start, and then bump mm. it from there. Um, in the same good. in the same vein, um, it has to be. Look, the thing is with uni and the school system in general is that um, a lot of it is out of the hands of the student. And it's at the the expectation of whoever you know the parent or the the school or whatever. Mm. Um, I felt like I was I was dragged along the the education system up until um, up until so when did I graduate? I graduated in twenty fifteen. Don't know how old I was, uh, but it wasn't until like a, two years after I graduated that I started thinking about education as a more of a something I wanted to do kind of thing. Mm. Um, before I was getting dragged through it because it was an expectation. Mm. And if you're somebody who is, you feel like you're just getting, you're doing uni just because everyone's doing uni, not because you actually have this plan. I want to do this. I want to study this. This is where I want to be. Then I think it's a waste of time because you're not going to find the motivation to do it. If you're going to do it and you want to do it the the halal way, you want to do it the the most beneficial way, which is like, okay, have a goal. This is what I want to achieve. Then it becomes your thing. It becomes your goal. It becomes your sort of, but with a lot of school, bro, like you get dragged into it because everybody else is doing it. You're not actually, you don't have your heart in it. You don't have your heart and mind in it. 
Um, and also you need to, you know, once again, what are you studying? Is it worth it? Is it necessary? Are there mm. alternatives? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and the, that's maybe a benefit of the 9k a year price tag is it makes you question more if you actually really want to do it isn't it yeah because at the end of the day we're, we're talking about the alternative of saving money and going for it saving that kind of money and obviously not spending from it and whatever is hard work it takes commitment and you have to really make the most of that because you don't want to save all that money all that hardship just to like mess about when you're at uni and get distracted by the mm. university culture and stuff and I definitely, if it, you know, I definitely recommend like avoid, avoid wholeheartedly any sort of university lifestyle, you know, living, living away from home, all of that stuff. I think it's an absolute waste of time. It wasn't something I did. I wasn't interested in doing that at all. Um, and I see the, you know, some people talk about the benefits, but I feel like the negatives will always outweigh the benefits. I can't really think of any real benefits um, apart from like, life experience which you can get anywhere and everywhere what's the point the dangers the fitness the distraction and i'm not just talking about fit now i'm talking about like distraction in terms of you not being able to study bro because you're just you want to treat it like a job yeah, you want to go coffee. yeah you want to treat it like a job bro you want to go go to that establishment study and leave you know bro. probably spend 3k a year just on costa bro silly it's silly but bro you know <laughs> This is interesting, yeah. So, so the different ways that you can afford it, because I saw what the sister saying is like, how do people afford it? How could you afford it? Um, she said, let me just read what she said again. She said, my parents won't allow me to work, so that's not an option. And she All said, right. whenever I bring up the issue of money, you tell me not to worry. I don't know. I mean, I it depends what they. It, it depends what your parents are you know, under the impression of, are they also under the impression that it's impermissible? Is that something they understand? If that's something that they understand and accept, then that's very good news for you because you don't have to fight that battle. That's one battle out of the way because yeah. it's very difficult for you to be pushed and pressured by your parents to go to uni and you're struggling to tell them that it's impermissible or you believe it's impermissible yeah. and you can't. Um, yeah, that's what I'd like to know because she said, our families are working class and don't have the funds to pay 9K a year. So yeah. she's not, pay you know, their parents are not paying for it out of pocket. But then also can't take loans. So, so where, I have a question. I guess though. she's wondering, like, uh, why are they saying don't worry when? Well, well, my question is mm. a bit of a paradox. They're not allowing you to work. So, why are you going to uni? What are you expected to do after uni? Surely your uni leads up to a job. Mm. So, what difference is it? Are you working now and you working afterwards? Mm. I need that meme, bro. That meme. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true though no, no. think about it what is it that they're expecting then or maybe they're saying don't worry like no we don't want you to go to uni because we don't want you to work <laughs> maybe that's what they're saying don't worry about yeah could be bro could be don't so, worry we got we got someone in mind for you don't worry <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna marry just, you off just drop the uni dream is it gone um, bro it's fun yeah so so you bro you basically took the loan you weren't aware of it is that it yeah bro and i was in crisis bro i remember my mm. first or second year like it dawned upon me that this might be impermissible. And I was like, yeah. I was, I remember having serious discussion with my mum, like whether yeah. I should drop out or not. Yeah. And yeah. I was, bro, I was terrified. I was thinking of dropping out completely because I was just mm. felt guilty that I was here. Then I realized I've already taken the loan out. So no matter what I do, even if I drop out, I still have to pay this back. Like the, it's been paid for already. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then I was just like, oh, like, am I going to have any bad in this? Is any blessing in this? Is, and then I, yeah, oh, it, was, it was a really stressful time. I remember it was my. very stressful. Mm. Um, so that's your experience. My experience, you know, uh, it's a bit different because I didn't like I've been to uni three times, uh, two of them in the UK, one of them here. Here, you know, the uni I went to, it was it was very expensive. It was more than 9K a year, but uh, I got scholarship, alhamdulillah. So that's one way you can go about it, you know, and, and also the last degree I did, you could say it was also scholarship. Um, so two of the three times someone else paid for it. So that's a way to, to look out for. I know these things, maybe sometimes they're quite uh, competitive, but you know, the, the, the third time I went uni, it wasn't competitive. The, the, the government's like, look, just come, come to uni, please. We need people to go to uni. So yeah. the, it wasn't too difficult to get that kind of money. Um, but, and I wouldn't have done that degree if that money wasn't there, you know? So that kind of dictated um, the decision. Um, so, so that's one option, right? Scholarships and 
uh, bursaries and grants and these kind of things. It's worth looking into that. And then uh, there is, I think what you said, bro, is interesting. Like to, I calculated 9K a year. If you're working throughout the whole year, that's 750 pounds a month that you need to put aside. And that's doable on 15 to 20 hours work a week. Mm. So that's manageable. I'm probably not easy, but I think that that will be really good in terms of your time management skills and your, you know, discipline yeah, and stuff, because ultimately uh, I've, you know, I've definitely experienced this in different phases in my life that it's the whole thing of, if you want somebody to get something done, go to a busy person because when you're doing stuff, it's easier to do more when you're not doing much, you, you find it difficult to do bits of things. Mm. So if you're going to work and then uni and then lecture and then seminar and then back to work. And I think you'll actually be more productive than if you're going yeah. to a lecture, then the seminar and then chilling a lot. I think you'll yeah. actually uh, become better at managing your time and stuff. I think that'd be an enriching experience. Now, if you can't work, I don't know, maybe you're just taking on a worry that they're saying, don't worry. And they're the ones paying for it. And so maybe you shouldn't worry, but ultimately I think there is that whole question of, why am I going to uni? Um, is it worth 27K? Uh, what's the ultimate goal I'm looking to get out of it? How likely mm. am I to get that goal out of it? Is this the only way to achieve that goal in the end? And all of those questions, you know, yeah, yeah. when it becomes I mean, it was, difficult, then ask these things. It depends. Like, once again, like, what are you studying? Are you studying something that there is a job that you can benefit from now? Like, I know a brother who's studying medicine, or he's due to study medicine. Um, but he works in a hospital just to get that sort of experience, um, just to be in that environment and stuff. And it's the same thing. Like, I don't get why, I don't get how your parents would allow you to go to uni so you can eventually have a job mm. and not let you work now. Yeah. Like, I could understand they're not going to let you work now, then, you know, or is it just for the sake of getting educated? And if mm. you're paying 27K just to get educated and not actually do anything with it, then you that's You could take a, a ton money, of, like, free Harvard classes and... Obviously, oh, yeah. the accountability and stuff isn't there, but with just 2K a year, you can buy some really good courses on specific topics and you also get educated or just reading will get you educated or joining a book club or whatever, you know? So it depends on the yeah. goal. That's something to think about. Okay. Um, yeah. Moving, yeah, on. So yeah, that was the email. What was it? Okay. Okay. Um... Oh, that's an interesting case. Oh, it's one of your designs. Oh, this isn't mine. No, no, this okay. is um, no, no, it's not. Inspired me though, <laughs> bro. Do you know how long this took to get here? I was from America, I think. Um, anyway, yeah, it's just long, long. It took COVID delays, bro. Mm. Sent one, they got lost. Sent another one. Um, a lot of these are comments as opposed to. Well, let's hear uh, the comments. Okay. Uh, let's try this one. Okay, there's one here that we obviously never did, but it's like, please talk about car insurance, especially in the UK. Like, <laughs> car insurance. Bro, that okay. is a fascinating topic. I think they're obviously talking about the halal and haram of it again. <laughs> you know, I actually hate sarcasm, insurance. so I shouldn't have been sarcastic there. <laughs> no. You need to stay calm, bro. All right, stop getting... I'm getting all excitable, bro. Mashallah. <laughs> car insurance. Uh, this, whoever this is wanted us to talk about car insurance. I think they might be alluding to the halal haramness mm. of it. We're not ulama, but the ulama that I've listened to sp sp speak about how insurance in general is impermissible. However, car insurance is mandatory and cars are pretty much a necessity in this day and age. But, you know, if you want to live a life of, you know, adhering Fine. to this. No, <laughs> adhering to the Quran. It's, I was going to say that. No way. Adhering to the Quran and Sunnah as much as possible. Oh. then maybe you don't need a car. You know, a lot of people don't. That live I mean, in, in London, stuff. that's a good argument. Yeah. Bro, I tried to go to London once without a car. Just me and I only had Suleiman then. Bro, it was a nightmare, bro. Oh, with carrying, kids? No, nah, that's yeah, carrying Carrying that buggy up the, the sub, up the tube stairs and stuff, Lame. bro. Oh, my God. I said never again. <laughs> I couldn't do it, bro. It's so difficult. Um, mm. Yeah, London on your own it's a breeze it does yeah. take long sometimes but you know people in london don't know what they what they've got Allah, the, the transport system is amazing and they're gonna i know yeah they're gonna be like what the hell how can you say 
it trust me yeah it's amazing it's have good. you been to Bro, wahran have country, you been man. to istanbul <laughs> yeah. have, actually yeah, istanbul anywhere. public transport is good but Achy. yeah Okay, just get on anywhere. Like it's simple, easy to read. Get a get a get an app on your phone or yes. get some map or something. You can get yes. anywhere in the country, bro. Like that. Like you just know. And the you buses, someone, yeah. If you if you live in the UK in anywhere outside yeah. of a big city, yeah, the buses come every twenty minutes or whatever. Yeah. In London, it's like boom, next one, next one, next one, yeah. next one. Sick. Sometimes they all call, come all at once, bro. Even even down here, bro, they've got really good bus service here. Like, actually, all these buses will come, and you just pick which one you want because all of them will go past. <laughs> yeah, something. I like that. So you're like, mm, I like, I take that one because it's empty mm. sitting there, bro. Mm. Oh, easy. You bro. know, I, I get... remember when I was doing my uh, master's degree. We're in a seminar, right? So it's supposed to, do, you know, you get marked for your participation in the discussion, and I came to that most of these seminars. Yeah, I came to seminar. I didn't understand nothing from these journals we're supposed to read, yeah? So I'm tr- literally, I'm forcing myself. I can talk, you know, I can talk well, but obviously the guy is going to know that you're not bringing anything of substance. But yeah. um, we were talking about, you know, like all this uh, transport and blah, 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 yeah? And I was saying, uh, I don't know, We I, I just made this point that, uh, like, are you guys nuts? Like, you're saying that, oh, the the what they call it the mayor blah blah and the london authority is rubbish at this and that i'm like do you understand what you've got here yeah Yeah, yeah, it's really really good and they're just like yeah but blah 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 and it was just this moment where i really was that outsider guy who's like i've seen other cities and this is like a really good standard maybe we shouldn't be moaning about this and it was uh, one of many moments like that where i was just this weirdo um yeah, it's always fun. It's fun. <laughs> Being a gharib all the time, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, even age-wise, I like the youngest and this and that. Yeah. So, uh, uh, okay, that was a... Uh, oh, uh, car insurance, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know what we're going to say about this other That's than it, the point we've, of... We've said what we've yeah, said. Yeah, it's like, uh, if you need it, you need it. What can you do? You can't drive without it. Um what about bro, getting an e- electric scooter instead? Oh, those are illegal, bro. Are they? Talk. Yeah, you know, I've been looking at them, you know, like, quite cool, you know. Oh, hey, like, people don't know, bro. That's that's against the law. The only reason people don't get stopped that much is because it's just too too busy to do police that. police resources. It's not... It is when... I mean, it should be, really. I'm, I'm sounding like Imagine an absolute hitting job's into worth, somebody but... going full speed. <laughs> this is it. And, like, yeah. you're not insured on it. And they're not insured, and um, yeah, it can get seized. And once well, it gets seized, into if they, someone's new car in one of those. The thing is, it's it's treated like a car, like a vehicle. And if it's if it gets seized, bro, you can't even claim it back because usually you have a car. If you drive a car with no insurance and it gets seized, then you obviously go to court, pay a fine, or whatever it is, get wow. points. Um, but you can always get your car back by coming in with the documents and stuff at the police station and getting your car back. But with um with these scooters bro they get seized and you can't even claim it back because it has no identifiable markers on it just you know to, mm. to, to fill what about the bikes then bikes aren't um bikes are pedals so they're not treated under the law the legislation as like mechanically prepared uh, propelled vehicles yeah okay i get that from a legal point of view but from a practical point of view a bike can also hit people can also hit a car yeah or get involved but in this, what i'm saying so the, the it's interesting actually if you like when I started obviously having to study the law, it's interesting how they almost treat it like a dean, bro. Like law is almost like a dean. If it's worded a particular way, then that's what gets legislated. And mm. because as the the bike cannot be a, mm. a motor vehicle because it hasn't got a motor, then it doesn't fall under that legislation. So they're is basically. Bro, they are whatever, yeah. yeah. They make then, up their own rules, bro. Hazard, Actually, to be honest, these scooters, power. bro. Actually, these these scooters, are, <laughs> these scooters are good, man. I think they're good. I really do. I think the government should just allow people to use them. Um, in some countries, they've trialed it. I know they were going to trial it at least in London, where they they were talking about allowing people to have them under a certain company, but they have to be rented. So you can't own your own one, but you have to rent it, and then those no. that company would be insured. Um, but yeah, these rules are a bit up and down, like. Or if they limited it to a certain speed, but the the, the real snakes in the grass are here, the people selling them because these these companies that are selling them, they put little disclaimers here and there on their websites, but the majority of customers don't know. Yeah. So they just buy it because they see everybody else sort of yeah. doing it. 
Yeah, I've heard that they're illegal in a few major cities, so I know it's worth checking out. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I'm looking into it. Uh, if you can get them out future. in the UAE, bro, I don't mm. know if it's illegal there. No, in, yeah, I think in the UAE it's uh, illegal, except uh, they did a pilot in a few areas of Dubai just to see, you know, how that would work and if it would be okay. But yeah, I'm not looking for UAE, but talk about that in another episode. But mm. yeah, um, yeah, insurance is insurance. You know, I had same out here. You know, you have to have insurance for your car. Kind of makes sense, but. Um, yeah, I mean, how would it work without insurance? You know, you hit somebody and you can't pay to fix their car. You, I guess you would need a fund for that, some kind well, of charitable fund to help people. I suppose out. they could do it all under the government where it's like, if you get in an accident and it's not your fault, but then people would exploit it, wouldn't they? Um, I don't know, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, but mm-hmm. like you would get it paid by the government, but then you, the, 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 the guilty party would actually own the would own the responsibility of paying back the government do they get fined based on that sort of because there are no accidents like and this is a big this is a strong policing theory i call it they say that there are no accidents in the in 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 there's no car accidents because there's always somebody at fault because everything's laid out to, to you know if if you were uh, too if tired, you or, rules, no one yeah, if you follow the rules, no one should hit anyone. So if you're like too tired or you distracted yourself or whatever, then it's your fault for not, you know, you shouldn't have been driving. If you were even, even to the point, if you were like frustrated or angry or whatever, and then you let That's your anger out. Deep. You know? I'm just thinking. You can think about it. Like, I'm trying to think of a way, unless it's like something out of the sky, bro, like a seagull. Bro, like the other day, Ahi, there was two seagulls in the street. Like one of them had been killed and the other one was still alive. And I, I couldn't stop. And I... I had to get into the bus lane to avoid them. And now I'm just, I'm just hoping, bro. I didn't, because I looked ahead and there was like a camera a bit further ahead. Oh, and man. Did mm. that camera catch me or not? Because <laughs> I hope it doesn't. I'm expecting to get a letter. How, how big is I don't the know. fine? I don't know. I've never done it before. But I'm how just much thinking, would you pay to save a seagull's life? Oh, I would, I would contest it because I, if they've got a picture of me swerving quickly into that bus lane, they should have a picture of the two seagulls, bro. It should be right there. And well, one they might of say, "Well, you should have just gone over them." No, nah, bro, I can't. I came back. I came back a few hours later because this was Juma. Came back a few hours later, um, and they were flat, bro. The one that was alive, Achi, they were both pancake. Achi, it's, it's deep, bro. Make sure how did how did it end up there? Like, how do, does a car well, I hit think, a seagull? Yeah, so it must have been like a car's hit two seagulls, killed one, and the other one sort of injured there. Um, I guess they they get too comfortable in it, these seagulls, and so they'll oh, get bro. very close to the road and all that. Right? Oh, okay, yeah. Mm. Okay, they're, they're relentless down here. Bro. I don't think I've ever hit an animal driving. Maybe a little bird at some point. Have I hit a... Yeah, maybe. I don't think I have myself, Yeah, but I've been in cars where other people have. Bro, you yeah. know, a few months ago, yeah, I was, I was next to a road. A cat was going to cross the road. Halfway across the road, it realises... It's not the right time. And then it goes back. It goes back and it's just nearly at the pavement. It's in the fast lane. And this, you know, Nissan Patrol, if you, if you know what that is, Nissan Patrol's coming very fast. And the cat was like frozen. Or it, I don't know if it meant, I doubt it meant to do this, but the cat just like went really low and froze. And yeah. it went between the wheels, you know, and it was. Oh, fine. mashallah. Oh, I thought I, I thought I was going to witness like that, but <laughs> carnage. Wow, man. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then it was fine. <laughs> Makes me sad, bro. I see them There's so much roadkill. Actually. I see it all the yeah, time. Foxes, like, it's fun. hedgehogs. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. I remember I was working um, my mom six months ago, maybe a bit less, and someone had hit a deer. Mm. And like we get we get called out if someone hits a deer because they've got to basically kill it because they don't usually die on impact unless it's like a truck. Um, mm. I was like, yo, I'll go and do it. I was like, I'll do it because I've done. Obviously, I've I've um, done obviously the, the bit here before sort of things. Mm. So I thought, give me a knife. I go out there to the countryside. I have some venison, baby. <laughs> 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 but um, but no, they get the they get the like firearms people to come along and, and just quickly in the head. Which is a shame, because if it's still alive, Achi, could eat, bro. Yeah? Mm. Could be some good eating. <laughs> <laughs> you made me think of Joe Rogan and then Mark Zuckerberg. 
on there. Why Zuckerberg, bro? Don't mind being that so video. Shit. There's that video of him saying smoking meats. You know that <laughs> one? No. Oh my I'm god. He did this uh, live stream and he's like, there's like a super cut of all the times where he says smoking meats. We're just out here smoking meats. Some meats, yeah. Smoking meats. <laughs> meat. <laughs> oh my god. Watch I'm gonna that. load that up for later. <laughs> smoking meats. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god, there's so many. Look at him. Yeah, he's <laughs> smoking it, meats. It's legendary. Well, I was listening to Joe Rogan the other day, yeah. With um, he had this guy called Graham Hancock on his show. Okay. I don't know if anyone's listening to this. I shared it on my Facebook. Bro, this Graham Hancock guy, I think he's like a journalist, but he was speaking about um I'm going to go off on a mad tangent, but <laughs> they, they, so history, historically speaking, they say that like civilization ha as, you know, complex civilization, you know, like statues and societies and all that sort of stuff and farming and that didn't really appear until like 5,000 years ago. And they always, they've always said that. And like some of the older civilizations, like obviously like ancient Egypt or like the Indus Valley, uh, Mesopotamia, that kind of thing. And in my head, yeah, as a Muslim, right. I've always like not believed that, you know? Yeah. Because I've always said, like, Adam Ali is the first human being, right? He he's clearly been put on this earth with any. Do you get me? Like he was given he was given knowledge of all things mm. in a sense. Well, and, 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 and then when when you when you obviously read the, the about the prophets and stuff, and you know, especially the early prophets, especially Adam Ali Salam and his sons and it's there's clear knowledge, bro. They're speaking with Hekma, they're speaking with knowledge, just they're aware of you know the dunya, they're aware of why they're here. And it wouldn't take that long for a civilization to be established, especially one that is conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Yeah. So I'm I was like, yeah, that never made sense to me. There's clearly a lot of lost history. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly wiped away, you know, a lot of you know archaeological evidence and stuff, just like he wiped away Ad, you know, with no trace. Hmm. Um anyway. Um, and then like he they've identified that even in, in Turkey there's a place called Gebekli Tepe which is like clear civilization bro like clearly you know statues buildings all this other stuff mm. dating like 10,000 years bro like 10,000 mm. like twice as long and then I was I saw that I was like yeah that, that's what I'm talking about like that's more likely and then they've got um, there's, they've found loads of stuff uh, basically what they what he's highlighted is that there's like a uh, geological evidence of like a great catastrophe specifically flooding and stuff um that happened about five do i say five thousand years i think maybe five thousand years ago and then all of this new civilization came so what his argument essentially is that there's been there's been complex civilization for way longer than they said they has mm. but then what's happened is modern archaeologists have come found a clean slate and thought oh this must be the start when actually it's not the start there was a lot before and it got wiped away so it looks like the start, and then yeah. So you're counting from the middle as opposed to counting from the start. Mm, yeah. Um, so like they were saying, like a uh, native, uh, they were saying like uh, the Americas, for example, they don't find that much five thousand years ago. Um, but actually, if you look further behind that, there's there's evidence that there was stuff way before. Um, mm. And he was also highlighting about how all these ancient cultures spoke of like great floods and a catastrophe and this and that. And mm. there's like there's evidence that maybe like a meteorite had struck the earth, causing Mm. Um, literally polar ice caps to completely melt like in, within w weeks bro and mm. you can imagine the sort of things that I lost within weeks can, of course. <laughs> honestly bro he said like there was he was saying that in America there was uh, ice like um, ice caps like two miles high that were literally grinding these civilizations to uh, you know like an eraser bro if you think about it like a two mile yeah. iceberg ice sheets and then after there was some sort of catastrophe that had obviously just melted all of that straight away. Yeah. And, and, they, and they, they indicate that maybe that's part of this whole great flood theory mm. that not just, you know, Abrahamic faith speak about, but even like Mushrikeen and ancient stuff speak about these things. And it made me think like, um, I don't know where I got this narrative from. It could be either from some hadith or someone of knowledge said it, but about like shirk, shirk didn't really start until the time of Nuh alayhi salam. And then before that, there wasn't really shirk. I don't know how authentic that is. I don't know where I heard that from. Mm. But it makes you think, Akhi, like, um, what, what it made me think is that that thing again about, like, uh, what is it? Like, history is told through the eyes of the, 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 the victors sort of thing. And he said, he, his argument was, like, the reason why they don't like to 
discuss these new findings and this new evidence is because it it aligns with with spiritual things too much and because science is very anti-faith and anti-religion as soon as it sees anything aligning to that it shuns it away mm. because it doesn't want to hear it and he was yeah. saying like science you know, as a culture rather than as a yeah uh, he was saying how like method. he gets he gets labeled like a sewer because i looked him up on wikipedia to see how authentic he was and he it says exactly what he said he said like oh, i get labeled a pseudoscientist but look at these graphs but look at this this evidence is right here you know what i mean another thing is like the sphinx in egypt apparently so you know the walls that are i don't know if you've ever seen the sphinx but it's like next to it there are two like walls like this okay. and he said that there's there's an erosion on those walls that indicates like 10,000 years of rainfall despite the fact that it hasn't rained in egypt since way before 5,000 years or something like that mm. so how can it, that um that building and that sort of structure be only 5,000 years old mm. when the actual walls that's been cut there is much older yeah. if you know what i'm trying to say yeah, um yeah. he said the only reason that the sphinx when they do like carbon dating and stuff is is showing to be much newer is because it's been restored so many times it's kind of like think about like the kaaba bro the kaaba when it was first built it was restored and restored and we're never going to have the same bricks but it doesn't mean they hasn't existed for age forever yeah. like if you yeah. were to carbon date the kaaba today it's yeah. not going to come back to this time of adam or the time of ibrahim because it's yeah. been restored so much yeah it's interesting yeah. and i think basically ultimately what i'm trying to get at is that I, I often fall victim to like just accepting the narrative of experts. And I know I, it's similar with modern day stuff. Like they talk about COVID, they talk about vaccines, they talk about all that stuff. And I do buy into those narratives. But something like this, where it's clearly going against the Quran or going against the Sunnah and stuff, a lot of people get a bit, you know, conflicted when they hear stuff like, you know, human evolution or, um, mm. you know, the non existence of jinns or whatever, whatever it is that you may think doesn't correlate yeah then it's actually it's just it's not that it doesn't correlate they just haven't come across the truth yet you know i mean even dinosaurs um there's something potentially going on there with the dinosaurs because yes there are skeletons fossils found but for example the idea that they were um reptilian i think is questionable apparently like apparently they are more like feathered um, mm. yeah but basically this whole thing of dinosaurs is very convenient for the whole evolution thing and so that's why i guess a certain understanding of them is always pushed but apparently there are other kind of theories of it and you know i think if you go into that whole thing of dinosaurs and the actual people who are researching it mm. you know you'll probably find that a lot of the time they're like well we don't know for sure for sure for sure you know mm. and, and you know, it's like even even when you talk about, oh, this expert said this about like what you said, like COVID or vaccine or whatever. It's like you might choose to take their advice because mm -hmm. it's the best advice you have in the moment. It doesn't mean that you're saying it's absolutely correct or accurate. True. I think it's the best for, thing we've got right now. For current things, I the, I, I think I draw a line between like Elm al -Ghaib and Elm that is observable here and now, you know, like when people talk to me about, you know, the history, the history of the world, the history of the human race, history of animals and stuff. That to me is in life because it's history now. And that's it. We can't observe that. We can't see that. We can't test that. It's a lot of theories and a lot of whatever. And there are things that you can find that point towards certain directions. Um, evolution itself isn't something that you can observe I mean, it is right a string now, of yeah. theories altogether. It's going to be, yes, you can, when you, re, if you were to research evolution or human evolution specifically, actually forget human evolution, just evolution as a concept, you can see that it makes sense to, to, to them because you see what they're arguing, mm. but it's still not something that you can observe. You can say, okay, yeah, I can see why you'd think that, you know, and, I, and that makes sense in a particular, you know, particular viewpoint, mm. but not realizing that all of these different animals and whatever, they existed in isolation in isolated times you know they didn't yeah they weren't aware of their ancestors and they're not aware yeah, of their, yeah. their i guess they're, they're taking a leap of faith just how they say yeah. religious people need to take a leap of faith they're actually taking a leap of faith because they're seeing a um you know um, some kind of monkey yeah. that whose skeleton might be somehow similar to a human's and then they're seeing a, a, what they would call a humanoid and they're saying, yeah. well, this one led to this. 
But you, obviously, you don't have exact proof that that led no, to of that. Of course, of course, it's, it, you're taking a leap of faith there, isn't it? Of course, and and so, um, you know, when it comes to like when it comes to animal evolution, like whatever it is, what it is, you know, that could be true or false. I'll, I'll be honest, as far as I'm, I'm aware, in the dean, there's nothing to negate that. When it comes to humans, however, we're quite clear that humans were a creation on their own, uh, put on the earth, you know, yeah. led on from anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, if you want to, but the thing is, if you want to say like ancient monkeys, ancient like, you know, ape like creatures led to the modern day chimpanzee, then fair enough, you know, fill your boots, go ahead. Because that chimpanzee, the, you know, the species of chimpanzee that exists today, maybe it didn't exist a million years ago. Do you understand what I mean? Yes. Um, so yeah, fair enough. But I, I, I just, what I'm ultimately trying to advise is to not get disheartened just because modern day sort of interpretations of the way the world is aren't don't line up. Like actually part of the, um, I found this phenomenal, but part of the, uh, his Graham Hancock sort of research and stuff led to this whole notion of, I don't know if you ever heard of like the lost city of Atlantis. Of course. Right? So Plato spoke about it. Was it Plato? Yeah. I think it was Plato spoke about it obviously in ancient Greece and he got it from his brother apparently. And basically it was a, it was like an oral narration of this city mm. that basically got absolutely lost in floods. Um, but it lines up with like this whole cataclysm of this ancient thing happening to the point where yeah. cities just disappeared. I think. And mm. like, we know for a fact, we know for a fact that there are places that got destroyed that at that time had amazing technology and capability and advancements. Like Plato sp spoke about this, city apparently being like very technologically advanced very capable mm. a lost planet Island speaks about ad in a similar way yeah speaking about their, their might and their power and how he completely yeah. erased them you know yeah. um so what's to say that there hasn't been civilizations in the past i mean we've got this confirmation bias that we're like we think that we are it we think that we have reached the pinnacle of you know human civilization and no one's ever beaten us in anything before um yeah, you've always got to approach this stuff with humility, man. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Bro, what is his name? Honey, uh, Tony Hinchcliffe. Uh, oh, no. One? No, that guy's a stand-up comedian. <laughs> no, uh, it's a quite an old episode. I think it was from oh, four years old. ago. Okay, okay, it's old. Yeah. Because this sounds... I think sounds he did like one recently. Joe Rogan. Um, I think he did one recently. And then yeah. I looked back because he. I think he initially mentioned, oh, when I was last on the show. So I wanted to see. Oh. So what's his if name? If you... If you go on my Facebook, uh, okay, just... I'll find it, inshallah. It's on my so, thing. I mean, that honestly is a really comprehensive discussion of insurance, I think, bro. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Never know when the next cataclysm is going to happen, Achi. Go <laughs> you yeah. got to look after your, your stuff. We no, got man. last... Um... Oh, okay. We got a last uh, email. Okay. So... Rashid, you know the man Rashid. He MVP, sent an bro. email through. Mind heist MVP, bro. <laughs> he said, Sarah, I come gentlemen. Been listening to some of your recent podcasts and thought this may be of interest. And he forwarded to us an email uh, from Muhammad Tim Humble. He said, That's Under bro. no circumstances can you hit the face or allow yourself to be hit in the face. If the coach agrees with that, no issues. Uh, there you go. Oh, it's, yeah. So he, uh, I think the question was, can I go to an MMA gym uh, and learn self-defense? Oh. So he's just saying, That's it. Uh, don't all you need to do phrase, bro, uh, is all you need to do is add another M to the MMA. You've got Muslim mixed martial arts, and you're good to go, bro. When everybody's under agreement, this is out of bounds. Yeah. Don't touch me in the face. If you hit me in the face, you're going home. You never come back. And people never do it. <laughs> That's it. That's all that needs to be done. We have our own tournaments. Mm. We have our own sponsorships. You'd be sponsored by Serum Masters. I wear Serum Masters on my uh, on my Under Armour top, bro. That's it. <laughs> Aura covered. Aura covered. You get me. No uh, people with the the boards. None of that. Everybody knows what round it is. I don't need you to come up here and tell me what round it is. All right. That's it, bro. You see what I'm saying? Very good. Very good. <laughs> There's a new. You know what? You saying that. I came across some um, advert the other day. Mm. I need to find it. It was like an alternative to YouTube. And I remember thinking, oh, um, Bro, I'm going to make an alternative to, uh, to YouTube. But Joe Rogan's uh, episode with Tristan Harris, you know, the one who did Social Dilemma. Yeah. 
I haven't and watched that, but I'll that was quite that. fascinating, bro. Because I didn't watch Social Dilemma. I don't have Netflix. I think it's only on Netflix. I don't know. And it sounded like more of the same. But a podcast, I feel, might actually be better than the actual documentary. Allah alam. Anyway, so yeah. I listened to that episode, and it was really quite interesting. And it made me think, like, I, I did feel like, yeah, we need uh, a YouTube alternative, but but we we kind of it feels powerless, you know. To, to make something like that yeah i remember like um but you know not even just that actually like uh for example you know like one path network had their own app and they have their own videos on there and stuff and and nobody going to tell them anything about what they're i mean unless yeah, yeah. Still but obviously shut them down. they've got uh resources to have that you know? yeah um for me for example to upload a video and for it to get discovered and all of that stuff that comes with youtube it's not possible. But, but do you know what? The alternative exists. We're just, we're just not trained in it. You know, if you'd look at, um, I know people have this whole notion of like the dark web and the deep web and all that stuff, but that is like, you're free yeah. to, you're free to upload what you want that, that way in that sense. Do you know what I mean? If yeah, but you, you don't have the eyeballs there, innit? No, uh, this is what I'm trying to say. Like if, mm. if we were, if we were more tech savvy and probably will be in like 50 years time, bro, it'd probably be what everybody wants to use. People are so scared about Maybe. their phones Bro, do, sending do, do data you have Tor? privacy. Do you have Tor on your, uh, on your computer. Oh, now, bro. <laughs> no, I didn't want that. I was curious, bro, back like when the okay. case happened. I was curious. I think, I, I think I, you'd get Tor, bro. You've had Tor. Bro, I've had Tor, bro. I went on there. I was like, are you impressed people trying to I sell know me. What Tor is? Yeah, of course, bro. You're a well cultured man. <laughs> they're trying to sell me like stolen credit cards and guns and stuff and i was like i don't know how real this is they wanted bitcoin i'm like i ain't got no bitcoin <laughs> and buy no gun i was like how i was just you just give a bit what are you expecting to do get some like random guy with a briefcase just walk out in the street and drop it there like some pickup thing like bro everyone's just getting scammed but there was like a um i came across uh a few sites that i thought were really cool one of them was like this library that just had books it was like all oh, these digital books. A lot of books on there like were things you couldn't get anymore and things that are probably banned as well. Censored um, stuff. Mm. Yeah, but it was all there available, like free knowledge, bro. The original um, Bible was there. The Injil. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bro, no. <laughs> but this is it, actually. Like, yeah, like if you're tech savvy and you want... But unfortunately, things like that only draw the eyes of criminals at this moment in time. Mm. But you never know in the future... Especially considering, like, there is a big voice, especially in like, you know, modern liberal societies where they don't want the government or the corporations monitoring them, and people get very anxious about their privacy settings. And mm. oh no, Facebook has access to this and that. And so there is a movement towards the anti of that. You know, there's yeah. been like antitrust lawsuits filed against Google and Facebook and stuff mm. just this week, bro. So mm. you know, it's very current. We'll see, bro. I mean, it's a fight worth fighting. It, it, you mm. know, it's a battle worth fighting, but it's hard to see how it would work considering if I was, for example, to set something like that up, I would have certain restrictions in place which would make it not favorable even to many Muslims, you know, never mind non-Muslims. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so, um, but it's one, of those two, it's one of those powerful tools, actually, mm. which I think uh, that's why it will head that way. Like it's the same with money. Like the whole thing that the whole theory of that Bitcoin has come out of, mm. which is like it's money that's not attached to any sort of controlling body. It exists in a mm. sort of its own space. That's yes. kind of like where the internet should be. Decentralized. You know? mm. Yeah, because you should be in control of what you want to do on the internet, no matter what, you know, mm -hmm. who says what. I should be able to choose if I want to see something or choose that's if I don't. That's a very libertarian yeah. Ideal. But if I'm a Muslim and I, you know, if I'm a Muslim and I want to, you know, be exposed to Islam in the best way, then I should be able to access that without any sort of intermediary. In the same way that I should be able to go and pick up a book and read it, like that's you should it. be I able can't... to access Haraji preachers. Well, then, if you don't know the enemy, bro, how are you ever going to combat his ideas, bro? If you don't know his ideas, I'm just he... saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> Bro, uh, my battery is going to end, uh, and because right, I'm bro. in a different location, don't have charger. So, all right, this is an excellent episode, actually. Jazakum uh, Allah Khairan for joining us. Uh, go to mindheistpodcast.com if you want to comment, attack, defend, anything like that. And thanks for joining us. Assalamu alaikum to the library, Kurt.